It certainly is a great day to be in God's house. Amen. Amen. It's one of those days where I walked out the door this morning and it was like the, the rain coming down was just rays of sunshine. I really didn't care. Today we're going to uh, end our study in 1 John um, chapter 5 is what we'll be going over today. I hope you guys have found this uh, study through this book as much of a blessing as I have. 1 John chapter 5 and verse 1 it says, Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God. And everyone who loves the Father loves whoever has been born of Him. By this we know we love the children of God. When we love God and obey His commandments. For this is the love of God that we keep His commandments. And His commandments are not burdensome. For everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world. Our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world except the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? Amen. Amen. When we read this, we need to make sure that we don't take this as instructions on how to be saved. You know, last week we were going over how to identify a false prophet. Then we moved on into these are the signs that you're saved. This is an assurance that you are a child of God. When we're saved by grace through faith in Christ, and that's it, amen. amen. Salvation is a gift from God, and our only part in this salvation is whether we accept it or reject it. When we put our faith in Christ, we're born again. Scripture here does not give us directions on how to be saved, but it gives us signs to tell us that we are saved. The absence of these signs can also give us a warning about false teachers, as we learned last week. The presence of these can give us assurance in our salvation. And verse 1 tells us that everyone who believes Jesus is the Christ, or the Messiah, has been born of God. So if you believe in your heart that Jesus is the Christ, then you have assurance in your salvation. Verse 1 also says that everyone who loves the Father loves whoever has been born of Him. So if you love your brothers and sisters in Christ, that also is a sign of your salvation. Verse 3 repeats a common theme with John, but in a slightly different way. It says if we love the children of God, we will know by the fact that we love God and obey His commandments. Amen. John just recently told us the opposite. If we love our brothers, we know we love God. If we know we love God, we know our brother. We know we love our brothers. It's all tied together. God adds here that his commandments are not burdensome. You know, the Greek word for burdensome literally would be translated heavy. Jesus told us, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. The only way we can be made God's commandments heavy or burdensome is if we love this world and the things of this world. If we're attached to this world, then God's ways become burdensome to us. Those who love Him open their hearts to Him and His ways and His commandments. And they are not burdened by them. Amen? They are a joy. God does not depend on our circumstances. Amen. These signs are another assurance of our salvation. And by our faith in Christ, we have overcome the world. This world no longer has a hold over us. Amen. Our society today sees us Christians as stupid, naive, gullible, or their favorite word, we're brainwashed. But we know the exact opposite is, is true, amen? We've had the veil taken off of our eyes. The scales have dropped and we can see. 
I once was blind, but now I see is not just a cliche and a song. It's a reality that unfortunately most people will never understand. I look at what's going on in our society and, and across the world. It's so I can almost see the strengths that are attached as Satan plays people like puppets. He manipulates those who do not follow Christ. Amen. Amen. And they don't even realize it. Some of the things I've seen in our government, not only the federal government that's been in most of the news here lately, but also the states and even the local, is just absolutely insane. To anyone with any kind of common sense or any kind of moral structure, you stand and look at it, and it, it's, it's hard to believe it's actually happening. Yet we see our media outlets let's cover these things like it's the greatest thing since sliced bread. I don't know if you've noticed lately, but there's a lot of crazy stuff going on in Oregon. And I, I have tried not to engross myself too much into the news because we know what's going on. We know what's going to happen. We just need to make, be make sure that we're prepared when the Lord comes back. Amen. 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 But there is a lot of crazy stuff. And I saw Friday, uh, they just passed a new law in Oregon. And a 15 year old in Oregon, they can't join the military. They can't buy cigarettes. They can't go to a tanning bed. They can't get blood. But they can get a sex change operation. And without their parents' consent. 15 years old. And not only that, the Oregon State would be happy to pay for it through their Medicaid program. Studies have proven that people that have what's called gender dysphoria, or they're confused about their gender, it rarely lasts past puberty. They grow out of it. But yet we've got these people who have made this law, giving these people free money so they can hurry up and shove them into a sex change operation, so then they have to live with that the rest of their life. Absolute insanity. But this is what's considered good and normal. You know, the prince of this world have people in an absolute stupor. They're blinded from reality. However, the children of God, and as it shows us right here, have overcome the world. Amen. Amen. Our victory is our faith in Christ. But unfortunately, those who travel that narrow road or go through that narrow gate will be few. Verse 6 says, This is he who came by the water and the blood, Jesus Christ. Not by the water only, not by water only, but by the water and the blood. And the Spirit is the one who testifies, because the Spirit is truth. For there are three that testify, the Spirit and the water and the blood. And these three agree. You know, most of the time when we're trying to understand Scripture, study Scripture, anyone who has that desire, that fire to do it, can understand what the Scripture has to say. You know, the Lord has given us the Holy Spirit to help us understand the Scripture. He's also given us multiple Bible study tools, teachers, scholars to help us understand it. But there are a few places, and this chapter happens to have two, that are very difficult to interpret with any certainty. Fortunately, none of these actually rest any doctrine of Christ on them. In verses 6 through 8, we find the first. Now we know about the Spirit. We know about the blood. But what is John referring to here by when he speaks about the water? You know, over the last 2,000 years, scholars have given at least four different interpretations, all with some valid points. Only two of these interpretations really hold any serious weight with most scholars. The first refers to Jesus as he hung on the cross. If you remember, the soldiers came by and plunged a spear into his side. Scripture tells us that blood and water flowed from that wound. So both the water and the blood testify to who Jesus is. 
and what he has done for us. The second is the what or the second interpretation would be that the water refers to Jesus' baptism. This is the most common interpretation among scholars, and I would have to say the one that I lean towards. It's also the oldest written interpretation by one of the early church fathers. A man by the name of Tertullian lived not long after the Apostle Paul died. Um, what he's written on the topic is this. For he had come by means of water and blood, just as John has written, that he might be baptized by water and glorified by the blood, to make us in like manner called by the water, chosen by the blood. And Jesus started his earthly ministry when he went to John for baptism. And Jesus did not need to be baptized and cleansed of sin. Amen? Amen. He was sinless. <laughs> Yet he went to John just like everyone else. And he was baptized. And in his own words, he did it to fulfill all righteousness. You know, we look at John here again as uh, refuting false doctrine at the time, mostly by the Gnostics. The Gnostics again preached that Jesus was God, but that he was not really a man. He only seemed like a man. He only was in the form or a pseudo phantom form of a man. He wasn't really a man. John makes sure that we understand that he was a man. He was baptized like us and he bled like us. His sacrifice on the cross would be nullified if he actually didn't come in the form of a man. Amen. 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 So here we see in Jesus' baptism, we see Jesus, number one. We also see the Holy Spirit that John the Baptist said came and landed on Jesus and remained. We also see the Father. When Jesus was baptized, the voice of the Father came and said, This is my beloved Son, and who I am well pleased. All three testify to who Jesus was and who Jesus is. That was the beginning of Jesus' earthly ministry. From that point on, he began to preach and teach and eventually shed his blood on the cross to pay the penalty for our sin. So Jesus' baptism testifies to who he is. His sacrificial death on the cross testifies to who he is. And the Spirit of God within us testifies to who he is. Amen. Verse 9, it says, If we receive the testimony of men, the testimony of God is greater. For this is the testimony of God that he has borne concerning his Son. Whoever believes in the Son of God has the testimony in himself. We have the Spirit inside of us. Amen. Amen. The Spirit testifies to us. <clears throat> Whoever does not believe in God has made him a liar. And this is the testimony that God gave us eternal life. And this life is in his son. Whoever has the son has life. Whoever does not have the son, God, does not have life. And that is a bold statement, amen. It's not the kind of statement our society likes these days, is it? If we listen to what men say, how much more should we listen to what God has to say? God testifies that Jesus is his only begotten son. He's the Messiah. And through Him and Him alone, we have eternal life. God says plainly that this is the truth and there is no compromise. There's no middle ground. You either believe this or you make Him to be the liar. Amen. Whoever has the Son has life and those who do not have the Son do not have life. That's a stark contrast to what the world's trying to tell us today. Our society, there's no absolute truth. Everybody has their own truth. That's what we're taught. If you speak the word of God boldly, your countenance is arrogant or a fool. 
to this world, everyone has their own truth. And there is no absolute truth. Well, the Word of God tells us a very different story, doesn't it? God says we shall have no other gods before Him. Amen. 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 Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the light, and no one comes to the Father except through me. That is not my statement. That's God's statement. But I would go so far as to warn those who believe in Christ to make sure that you believe in the real Christ. Not some Christ that some false teacher has made up for you to soothe your edging ears. Not some Christ that you've made up in your own mind to suit your way of life. The Christ who is in the scripture. Dedicate yourself to studying the scripture with an open heart. Learn who he is and not who you want him to be. Amen. Amen. Verse 13 says, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life. And this is the confidence that we have toward him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the requests that we have asked of him. John here tells us, again, the purpose of what he's writing is to assure us of our salvation. But this also gives us a statement that a lot of people are not too fond of. You know, when we ask the Lord for something, we want what we want. We want it now. But God only does what's in his will. Amen? Amen. Amen. And his will is to do what's best for those who love him. Amen. Amen. We know that he hears our prayers, but sometimes that answer is no. And we should trust that even when we don't understand the reason why God will let us go through something or not give us what we want, that his decision is in our best interest and that he is always with us. Verse 16 says, if anyone sees his brother committing a sin not leading to death, he shall ask and God will give him life. To those who commit sins that do not lead to death. There is sin that leads to death. I do not say that one should pray for that. All wrongdoing is sin, but there is sin that does not lead to death. You know, earlier I mentioned that there are two places in this chapter that are very difficult to interpret. For 16 and 17, we find the second of these sections. The question is here, what is the sin that leads to death? Nowhere in the scripture does John elaborate or tell us what the sin is. There have been a few over the years that have tried to define this as blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, as spoken of in Matthew 12, 31. You know, in that passage, the Pharisees had accused Jesus of casting out demons by the power of Beelzebub. Jesus proclaimed that he cast out demons by the Spirit of God. So the Pharisees were attributing the work of the Spirit to Beelzebub, or the devil. That is blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. Matthew 12, 31 reads like this. <clears throat> Therefore I tell you, every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven people, but the blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven. And whoever speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven. But whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven, either in this age or in the age to come. So we see this does not work to interpret the sin that leads to death described here in verse 16 and 17. For one, the verse starts off by describing a brother committing sin. And we know that someone, a brother in Christ, would not blaspheme the Holy Spirit in this manner. Amen? Amen. But second, the passage here does not talk about a sin that will not be forgiven as the one Matthew did. It talks about a sin that leads to death. J. Vernon McGee uh, describes pretty well the most common interpretation of this passage. 
and he describes it like this. Death refers here to physical death. It has no reference at all to a spiritual death because the child of God has eternal life. John is saying that believers can commit a sin for which their Heavenly Father will call them home. That is, He will remove them from this life physically. Perhaps even because they are disgracing Him. I mean, He gives several examples from the Bible, but for the interest of time, I'm only going to read a few. He says, in the New Testament, we have another example of this. Ananias and Sapphira. They were a part of the early church, and they were guilty of a lie. They had been willing to, to give false impressions to the early church. They were willing to live a lie. Because of that, God removed them from this earthly scene. And we can look at that example and understand that early church. God had a purpose for that church. God was doing things, and these people were standing in the way of His will. Amen. They were still children of God. He still loved them, but they were doing things that they should not be doing. He took them home. There's another incident mentioned in 1 Corinthians. Some people there had actually been getting drunk at the Lord's Supper, and they were missing the meaning of it altogether. Paul wrote to them, For this cause, many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. That is, they were dead. Paul was saying they had committed a sin unto death. Someone might ask this point, what is a sin unto death? First, let me be clear that John was not speaking of an unpardonable sin. We are talking about a sin unto physical death, not spiritual death. These people were God's children. He would never take them home if they had not been his children. The Lord doesn't whip the devil's children. He whips his own children. When his children sin unto death, he will take them home. Then he gives a story. He says, let me illustrate this. There is a mother who has a boy, Willie, her little angel child, of course. Next door, though, there lives a little brat, about the same age of her angel. And they play together in the backyard. One day, as he was working in the kitchen, she hears that little brat yelling at the top of his voice. She rushes to the door, looks out, and there is her precious little angel on top of that little brat, just beating the stuff in that. She says, Willie, you are going to have to come in the house if you're not going to play nice with that little boy next door. He says, yes, Mama, I'll be better. She says, well, if you're not, I'm going to have to bring you in the house. So she goes back in, about 30 minutes go by, and again she hears the familiar cry of the little brat next door. She goes to the door, and the same sight greets her, her precious little angel on top of that brat next door just beating and stuffing at him. She says, I said that if you did that again, you would have to come in the house. So what does she do? She goes out and gets him by the hand and takes her precious little angel, yelling at the top of his voice, into the house. He had to come in. He may not be her precious little angel anymore, but he is still her son. The fact was never disturbed, but he can no longer play outside. And I think that if a child of God goes on disgracing the Lord down here, the Lord will either set him aside or take him home by death. God doesn't mind doing that. I think he does it in many instances. I would add for myself, in my knowledge and watching how the world works, we also have to keep in mind that there are sins that just naturally lead to death. Amen. Amen. God created the world in a certain way, and as they say, you can't cheat physics. If you're going to go out and get sloppy drunk and climb behind the wheel of a car, it's quite frankly possible that you're not going to make it home. If you were a Rome or a in John's day, and you happen to lose your temper and punch one of the Roman officials in the mouth, or one of the soldiers that would come by and make you carry his stuff, it's quite likely that you would end up on the end of the sword. Sometimes our actions directly lead to our death. And that's the sin that would lead to death. Verse 18 says, well, let me back up. We need to understand, though, Regardless of whatever we try to interpret that as, the sin 
unto death. The most important part of that passage is where it starts. If our brother is sinning, we need to pray for him. Amen. Verse 18 says, We know that everyone who has been born of God does not keep on sinning, but he, being Jesus, who was born of God, protects him, and the evil one does not touch him. We know that we are from God, and the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. And John already has taught us in this letter that the children of God do not make a practice of sin. Amen? Amen. Amen. But when we do sin, we have an advocate. We have a protector in Jesus Christ. Amen. The world is under the power of the devil, but we have been set free from the evil one. We are of God and we understand the truth. Amen. Amen. In verse 20, God goes on to say, and we know that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding so that we may know Him who is true and we are in Him who is true, in His Son, Jesus Christ. He is the true God and eternal life. And how blessed are we that God has given us that knowledge, that He's opened our eyes and let us see the truth. There's a lot of blessings that we overlook in life. That should be the first one we think of every day. He closes up with a simple warning. And I would imagine in his day this was a very common warning. Or a common saying, a common way to end a conversation or a letter with brothers and sisters in Christ. Because it was one of those things that was preached more heavily than I think anything else in that society because they lived among pagans. And that is, little children keep yourself from idols. You know, back then and today, people worship idols, stone, wood, metal, worthless things, animals, whatever. But we know also that in Ephesians 5.5 5 and Colossians 3.5, that the Apostle Paul tells us also that covetousness is idolatry. The worship of things, money. We should put nothing before our God, amen. amen. <coughs> Let me just say that it has been a blessing over the past five weeks in this study. I don't know what the God has showed you. I know Brother Damien's been going over the same material in, uh, in our Sunday school class. It's truly been a blessing to me, and I know others. So to wrap up our study in the epistle of 1 John, let's just go over and reflect on just a few things that we've learned. Number one, God is light. Amen. God is love. <coughs> and God is life. Amen. Amen. Those who choose to follow Him will live in His light and his love, and he will give us life as children of God. If we follow his commandments and love our brothers and sisters in Christ, we have assurance that we are children of God. Bow your heads with me if you will. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, if you're not counted among the children of God, there is no better time for to remedy that than right now. You know, none of us are guaranteed another day on this earth. Christ tells us to be ready, to be waiting. In John 3, 16, it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And when he says believes, he doesn't mean a simple acknowledgement that Jesus Christ existed, or even any acknowledgement that he is the Son of God. You believe, you believe, you trust, 
in Christ. You believe what he said. You believe what God said about it. You believe the testimony given by the Holy Spirit, by the water, by the blood. If it's your desire to give your life to the Lord today, to be adopted as a child of God, I'll lead you in a prayer in a moment. You don't have to say it out loud, but you do have to mean it with all of your heart. Pray with me if you will. Heavenly Father, I'm a sinner and I need you in my life. I turn away from my sin this day, Lord, and I turn my life over to you. I ask that you forgive me my sin and replace my will with yours, and I will follow you for eternity. In Jesus' name I pray. With every head still bowed, every eye still closed. There is one here today that said that prayer for the first time, and you mean it. I ask you to just look your head up at me and continue to look at me. I have three questions for you. If you said that prayer, listening to the CD, or if you saw this on the internet, I welcome you to the family of God. Did you say that prayer today? If you said that prayer, I welcome you to come and visit us here at Shining Light Baptist Church. Help us, let us help you grow in your faith. Maybe you're a Christian today. Maybe something in God's Word has, uh, has woke you up, has shook something inside of you. We have, we're going to have prayer warriors up here. If you need to come and pray, the altar will be open for you. I welcome you to pray also in your seat. Pray for those who are not saved. Amen. You may raise your head. Very good, please. Stand with me, please.